Okay, we'll give it, uh, John, we'll give them about a minute or less okay. and, and let people come in. Because you can see the attendee counter on the GoToWebinar uh, creeping up there. Oh, yes, indeed. So when it starts to settle down a little, you know, uh, we'll just start up. Oh, that's, well... Okay, I guess that's good. Hi, my name is Rob Canzanari. I'm the uh, Data Architecture Virtual Chapter Leader. And I want to thank everyone for coming in today to our uh, webinar. Um, if y'all want to reach me at any time, you can always email me at my contact here is rob at sqltigers.com. I have a blog to sqltigers.com where I, I post the things I do. And today I have a, a good friend of mine, John, came on to do a great webinar. I think it's a great topic. Everyone needs um, knowledge of queries and how to improve them. And I'm really excited to have him here today. So I'm going to go to the next slide, hopefully. Yeah, here we go. So PASS has a conference called the Business Analytics every year. And they gave me a code to pass on to y'all. And it's B-A-V-C-A-R. And it saves you $150 off a of registration. So if you have an opportunity to go to this great conference, you want to save some money, use that code, and uh, I mean, that's great. I I'd use it if, if I was going this year. I might go still, and I'll use the code. So there are a lot of virtual chapters out here, and here's a screenshot of some of them. Um, I, maybe, yeah, some of them. And you can see there's always something going on. So if you want to, you know, you're interested in big data or, or high availability or uh, in-memory databases, log in the past, sign up. And they always have great webinars, like the one we're having today. So um, it's a way to get free knowledge, exchange knowledge, learn a lot of stuff, and it's all there out there waiting for you. Um, here are some upcoming SQL Saturdays. Um, you can see, like, the, all over the country. you got Richmond, Silicon Valley, Boston, Madison, Huntington Beach, Ottawa, just and international ones, too. So um, if you happen to be able to attend them, I can't recommend it enough. They're great. You learn a lot. You see some people speak. A lot of great topics. So the other thing is PASS is always looking for volunteers. So if you want to get more involved, um, you can then visit this link, volunteer at sqlpass.org, and uh, they'll, uh, you know, and, and it has all sorts of opportunities. To, you know, you can even do a virtual chapter one day or you know there are a lot of things you can like get involved with so visit the uh, link and you'll see what's out there and finally um here are some links to get you know stay involved of course you know that pass has a linkedin and a facebook account and even a twitter account so um there are the links and the membership is free uh so that's all i have to really say right now i want to turn it over to john john thank you for doing this today no, oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. So I'm going to switch over to your screen right now. Hopefully it'll come up perfect. There it is. Great. So um, a few things I, I forgot to mention that are really important. We're going to take questions at the end of the uh, webinar. So if we have some time, we're going to take the questions then. We're recording the webinar. It'll be on the uh, past data architecture chapter. Or you can uh, go to my blog, and I'm going to put links to it from my blog, too. And uh, that's all uh, I can think of right now. So, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you again. Oh, no problem. Thank you for letting me be here. Yeah, also, you can reach out to me many different ways, which you'll see here on this screen, whether you want to throw something at me at Twitter or send me an email at Gmail. If you don't get a chance to get through your questions, uh, Go ahead and definitely free, feel free to reach out to me and we'll, we'll get you in the right direction. So just a little bit about me. Um, I love SQL Server and the PASS community. Uh, you can see me in a lot of SQL Saturdays. I travel to go speak at user groups. I actually run the High Availability Disaster Recovery Virtual Chapter and the Austin SQL Server Group. And, love performance tuning and almost anything that's on the relational side of SQL Server. So one of the biggest problems with performance tuning is 
being able to know where to start. A lot of times when I'm working with people, and even when I started way back as a performance tuner, was trying to do a good root cause analysis to figure out which statement should we look at to tune in the first place. So one of the biggest mistakes is not being able to identify which queries are your top offenders and how to look at them. We're going to go over an example of how you can do that here with extended events. So you're not playing whack-a-mole tuning all kinds of queries and you're finding out they're not giving you the exact help that you're hoping for. So here's today's agenda in a nutshell. We'll go over a little bit of use, using extended events for you to be able to find your top, of, like, top offending queries. We'll go ahead then and show you exactly, well, how do you go ahead and baseline your queries? So as you are modifying them, whether you're using indexes or you're doing some code tuning or some other things, how can you know the difference between the executions between them? We'll look at execution plans in a little bit as we're going through and looking at T-SQL anti-patterns. And we'll also cover a huge scenario I see repeated over and over again with indexing. Um, so we'll kind of go over a little bit the good, the bad, and the ugly between indexes. And then finally, where most of the time will be spent today is going over just a lot of what I would call anti-patterns for T-SQL. So these aren't bad developer patterns, they're just patterns that I tend to see a lot through development that aren't optimizer friendly. I can kind of show you some ways how you could rewrite them to make them more optimizer friendly so they run quicker. <coughs> so these are all the demos we're going to go in. So from here we're just going to stay over in Management Studio. We're going to go over um, how you can use extended events so you can go ahead and aggregate without having to write any T-SQL code or any, do any T-SQL work at all to kind of find your top offenders for a workload. Then from there we're going to kind of go over a bookmark lookup indexing example where I see a lot of people using an index that ends up actually causing partial duplicate indexes. And then from there we'll go ahead and look at inline scalar functions, some sargability, look at some myths between uh, table variables and temp tables, and go look at CTEs versus temp tables also, and go from there. So with that, we're going to go over looking, how can you identify your, your top offenders? So I'm going to show you two parts here. We're kind of going with the cooking style methodology here, where I kind of got close to the end point, so I'll show you how you can create your extended event if you've never created one before. And then we'll go back over here to show you exactly, okay, how do you slice and dice the data to real easily find out what are your top offenders for the workload you capture. So real quickly, if you've never created an extended event before, you're going to see here that we have under management extended event sessions. You can go over here, and what I strongly recommend is actually doing a new session instead of session wizard. And the reason why is because this is going to look just like a wizard, but it's actually going to give you a lot more control and functionality that you don't get inside of the wizard that's built in with Management Studio. So one of the really cool things, if you never looked at extended events before, is you can start typing and it'll filter all the events that you could select. So for example, here we can say we're looking at T-SQL top offenders, so you're probably going to want to look at batch completed. So this will give you all kinds of metrics you'd want to know for your statements that are completing, like how long did they take, how many reads did it, did it take for the query to run, how much CPU was needed. So we'll add that, and then we'll also add SP statement completed. So that way you can get the statements inside of your, your objects. So that way if you have functions out there or you have stored procedures that have multiple statements in there, you can look at each individual statement. So from there, you can go over to configure here. And a nice thing here also is you can hold shift and click on your events here, and it'll apply configurations to all of them, so you don't have to do them one by one. And there's one key global field that you really want to make sure you are adding if you want to pull your top offenders. And that one key global action is going to be your query hash. So every time a query is running, you can get a unique hash for that query statement. So perfect example is you have a stored procedure that's running and parameters are constantly changing. This will give you the text for those statements regardless of the parameters and their being used. So if you want to, you can add a lot more, like database name. Uh, the one 
thing I would tell you is be careful here because the more actions you're going to add, the more resources are going to be consumed by your extended event session. So of course here you can also add filters because we have both events highlighted, this would apply to both of them. So for example, if I just want to say, let me do some tuning or identify offenders where we have some logical reads. So this is kind of a good way to filter out a lot of junk that you wouldn't want to see. So that way you're really only focusing on your top offenders. So from there, you can configure exactly how are you going to end up storing your extended event data that's being captured. So there's two that I constantly see being used, which would be going out to an event file or actually going out to your ring buffer. So ring buffer is a nice way for saying memory and Extended event is going out to a file just like you probably used to do with profiler or server-side traces. So and from there you have some advanced features that you can also go ahead and tweak. And from there you could go ahead and set up your extended event section. So here we have our new one here. And to show you, you can go ahead and start and once it's starting, watch light data. To save us some time here so we can dive more into the actual statements we want to go ahead and tune, I already ran a workload and captured it for us. So if you want to add columns to what you're seeing, and this probably looks a lot like Profiler, if you've used Profiler before, you could go ahead and you can add extra parameters over here. So for example, if I also wanted to maybe aggregate by our query plan hash, I can click show column and table and you'll see that it gets added over here like it did on the right. So one thing I did is I went and I stopped my data feed. So I have my whole workload that I want to quickly do some analysis against. There's two really cool functions inside of extended events that can let you slice and dice this data really quickly. Um, so one of the things in here is going to be our grouping. So as I mentioned, the one action you want to make sure you include in your extended event is query hash. So that way we can now group by the query hash. So that way we're going to be able to group everything by statements that are run regardless of what parameters we use. So we can see that all those statements just real quickly got nested here into a couple of hashes that we grouped upon. So we could quickly expand and you'll see everything that's included for those queries that are running. Then the next step here is that we can now aggregate off of this. So for example, if we wanted to, we could say, what's the average rights or what's the total rights for those statements for the workload that you captured? Same thing for CPU, same thing for duration. So same thing for logical reads. And then you can say, how do we want to sort this data? So if we're going to focus on which took the most to run, we would do duration, and we would tell it in descending order. So if anyone on this webinar has gone through the pain points of doing server-side traces and gone through doing Profiler, you'll see that this is a huge improvement, a lot quick, easy way for you to quickly look at a workload and figure out, okay, well, what statements do I probably want to focus my tuning time on? So I'm not doing the biggest mistake I commonly see out there in performance tuning, which is focusing on statements that aren't your top offenders, so you're not going to get the best bang for your tuning time. So from that, we'll go ahead and we'll go over to our first example here. So we're going to go over how do we go ahead and benchmark our queries. So we're going to go ahead and take a good look on how do we get a good starting point in non-production, how do we go ahead and look at the execution plans? And how do we go ahead and benchmark as changes are made? So we're going to go ahead and let's run this in our Venture Works database here. So one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and enable some statistics. So when a query runs by enabling set statistics IO in time, I'm going to be able to see not only how long did the queries take to run, but also how much IO was used. You know, how much I.O. did we have to use coming from disk? How much was already in memory? So now to get a starting point. So this is something I, I strongly recommend is you're tuning queries in a non-production environment. So when I identify in production, what I like to do when possible is to be able to 
take them into non-production. So that way I can start off with the worst case scenario, which is a cold starting point. So the three commands I'll typically do in non-production is I'll do a checkpoint so that way I can take all my data pages and take them out of memory and have them be written to the data files. But then I'm also going to go ahead and clean all of my data pages in memory and go ahead and take out all of the execution plans that are also in memory. So this way it's going to force us to start cold by building a new plan and also at the same time bringing data from disk so that way you have your same starting point that's always your worst case scenario. All right, so the very first query I'm going to run here is extremely trivial. So we're going to have two statements from the same table here. One is going to be a select star, and the other one is going to be only three columns from the same table. So the big difference here is pulling back every single column versus just three columns. But we're going to pull every single row that exists for that table. So before we run this, another thing I want to show you is how you can look at execution plans inside of Management Studio. So one of the easiest ways you could do this is by looking at the two options up above here. So the very first one, so we can see here, this is going to go ahead and get you your estimated execution plan. So this means it's not going to actually fully run the query. It's just going to go ahead and build the plan and show that to you. The second one over here is going to be the actual, which we're going to be focusing on the actual here for the rest of this session. So you see I have that highlighted there. And we'll go ahead and we'll let this run. So obviously we have select star, which is every single column, versus just the columns that we need. The very first thing we're going to do is look at our execution plan here. So even if this is the first time that you're diving in and you're looking at execution plans, there's a couple of things to focus on here. One is the cost of the query. So SQL Server is a cost-based optimizer, which will assign you a cost. And when you're running two queries that are exactly the same or very similar, that you have one which is your original and one which may be a different change, typically you're going to see some differences in here that can help you get a good overview and look at the cost for the queries. So in this case, the one thing I want to point out is you, we have a clustered index scan across both. So a lot of times when you start looking at execution plans, you may see the clustered index scan and assume this is great because you're using your clustered index. What this is telling you is it's scanning across every single row in your table, and your table has a clustered index on it. So when we look at our statistics here, a couple things to note is So our logical reads, even though we have every single column in the first query and only three in the last query, the logical reads here are exactly the same. So we're not getting any benefit there because we're scanning across our clustered index. So that means it's going to go ahead and pull every single row that's there. The benefit that you are going to see is in the elapsed time because this is pulling only those columns that you need. But this is just giving you a good example of showing you set statistics I.O., set statistics time, and a good example of how you'd want to go about benchmarking your queries as you're going and changing them and trying to figure out how to make them run quicker. All right, so from this point on, we're going to focus mainly on making queries run faster. In this first example, we're going to really focus on bookmark lookups, and we're going to go into how to eliminate a common scenario where I see adding indexes to make the query run faster ends up being a lot of partial duplicate indexes. So in this very first example here, we're going to do first name and last name from our person's table to pull everyone that has a last name as Smith. So as you would expect, we don't have any indexes in here. We have our clustered index scan. And we even have what looks in here is an index recommendation. Um, so one thing to really note here is a lot of times I will see people out in the field, they'll take these and they'll just automatically add them. And why this looks good for that query at that point in time, this is where I can see this really hurt your query performance because you have tons and tons of indexes because you're always going in and adding indexes. 
So we're, we're not going to go ahead and take that recommendation. We're actually going to look at our query here and take a stab at this and see what do we need to make this run better. So the first thing that should jump out at you is that we're filtering on last name where the user is Smith. So it's going to be a really good idea for you, if you can, to look at your current ex existing indexes. And one way you can quickly do this, if you highlight your scheme in the table name here and hold Alt and do F1, this will go ahead and show you a lot of details about the table. So while this wouldn't show you every single thing about an index, this is a good starting point to let you know what kind of indexes do exist and what keys are used for the columns. There's a bunch of other scripts out there that can give you a lot more great detail, but this is even just a quick, great, good start for you. So we saw we didn't have an index for the last name in there. So the very first thing we're going to end up doing is we're going to go ahead and create an index. So I copied out how long it took to run. So if we go back to our, our messages over here when we run our query, you'll see that it's almost 4,000. And we're doing our full scan over here. So clustered index scan. So we go through in here, we're going to create our index. And now we're going to run the exact same query again. So if we look at I.O. alone here, you're going to think, wow, this is great. Because we just went from, from almost 4,000 logical reads down to a little under 300. One thing I want to point out is if we look at the execution plan, there's a couple things that should jump out at you. So especially if we have any developers that are watching this, a nested loop here that we're seeing here, is what you probably know well as a for loop. Basically what we're doing is we're taking everything from the top, so all the rows in here, it's going to go through and it's going to do whatever is underneath it here. So there's two things that we should focus on from that index that we just added. So the first one, which is great here, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and control so that way we get our box there. So we have our index C, so we're no longer doing that scan across the clustered index. So this is great. With that said, there, there's one opportunity that you could have for improvement over here. And that is the key lookup here. So a key lookup basically means that, John, you had some columns in your select statement that were running that we need but we didn't include them at all in your index, so while we're able to make this run faster from the filter, we gotta go back and we gotta pull those columns so we can return that select statement to your end user. So an easy way to go about fixing this and make this even better would be to use what's known as a covering index, which means you're gonna go ahead and include columns in it. So the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to drop that index we just created. We're going to recreate it over here, except we're going to add include, which means first name will be added to the bottom of our B tree, so that way it can be tagged along in the index so we don't have to do that key lookup. So we're going to go ahead and take that exact same query, run it again. So even if you're brand new to looking at execution plans, you can see here that we went from three operators down to one. So we have our index seek. We're seeking across the B tree and only pulling the data that we need. And we went from 300 logical reads to, to four here. So great stuff. This is probably the best you're going to get out of this query. Now the big question I have for you is what happens when other end users are going to run slightly similar queries? What kind of performance are you going to get and what actions are typically taken to make those queries run faster? And this is where I start to see some mistakes. So for example, we have a very similar query here. The only difference is we're adding another column to our select statement. So when we run this, we're going to get what we previously saw, which is that index seek with a key lookup. And the reason why is because even though we had last name as included, we didn't include first name. So as expected, we jump back up to 300. 
So here's the mistakes that I tend to see out in the field. People will use tools like Data Tuning Advisor, or maybe they're just looking at dynamic management views for recommended indexes, and those don't really do a good job of looking and seeing what indexes do you currently have and how they maybe should be tweaked instead of creating what's known as partial duplicate indexes. So that way you have indexes that have to be maintained for all your insert updates and deletes that may not even be used for each day. So here we're going to go ahead and we're going to create that new index, just like I commonly see out in the field without even looking at what indexes we have. We're going to go ahead and rerun our query here. And we have our index seek again. Everything's looking great. Three logical reads. The thing to point out here is when we look at a query that I have for our partial duplicates, we are going to end up seeing that we now created what's known as a partial duplicate. So what this means is that second index we created, which has the first name and the last name as included columns, will actually be sufficient and work for that first query. So that one index can cover multiple queries instead of having different indexes that are only helpful for one query in general. So the big thing that I recommend here is taking a look at what indexes you have and go through and, and maybe look to see, can I tweak an index that exists to solve the bigger problem instead of adding a whole bunch of uh, duplicate or partial duplicate indexes. So to fix this here, all we're going to do is drop that first index that we created. And I'm just going to show you here, we're going back to that very first query. And because we have our second index, which included first name and middle name, that we're still seeking across it. And even in this case, our IO is still minimal. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and take a look now at sargability. So sargability is a, a fancy term that you may have heard or read that's basically telling you that, all right, you did a good job and you have an index, but the index itself can't be used for this query because there's something going on in the query that's causing us to have to do scans instead of looking at the index for a seek. So a perfect example, kind of staying with our previous example at looking at last name, first name, middle name from the person's table, is a case where we want to start our text filter with a wild card. So this is actually, if you have a lot of queries like this, this is a scenario where you're probably going to want to maybe start looking into full text search. And the reason why is because if you think of a B tree and its structure, if it's starting with a wild card, it's not going to know anywhere. It's not going to have an idea of, okay, where do I start so I can filter out part of this index? It's going to have to scan across all of it. So when I run this, when we look at our execution plan, you're going to see your index scan in here. So if we're able to change this to where we don't have that first wild card, we're going to see now we can actually figure out, okay, where do we want to skip inside of our index and actually do a seek across it. So this is a perfect example where now we're going to start seeking off that index we just created. So I'm going to try to beat this through a hammer with so many different real basic small things that you may end up doing with your queries um, that will give you the same result as something that's very similar but be treated very different from the optimizer. Another good example is a scenario where you maybe want to filter by you know, the first letter of the last name. So commonly out in the field, I'll see people apply a function like substream. They'll do it across their column they want to filter against, and they're going to tell it, you know, start with the first letter and give me just the first character. And then their actual parameter, what they want to search for, is static. So when we do this, we're going to see that scan across the whole table. So your other option here, which functionality is exactly the same thing, but will greatly help you with performance because it's going to actually be able to seek across the index, would be to not have a function around your column and just say like and then start with that character that you need. So this is exactly the same thing as the top, just this is going to be more optimizer friendly so it's going to be able to seek across that index we just created instead of scan across it. And that's exactly what we see here. So once again, if for, for people that are pretty new to execution plans, just looking real basic high level at cost, 88 good. 
Oh, sorry, I have this backwards here. Let me erase that. 88 here, high. 12, better. So this is also going to show you here, as I mentioned, when we're doing our operation here we're seeking, where up top here we're actually going through and we're scanning. So once again, exact same result set here. You're going to see here we've got a little over 2,000 rows in each one of them. The only difference here is the bottom one is sargable, meaning it can seek across the index, and the first one cannot. So the next thing we're going to look at here is we're going to play with some dates learn a little bit. Uh, just to give you a little background on this first one, all we're really trying to do here is we're going to trim off the time. So that way we can really just search off the date for columns that are using date time or date time two instead of just date. So constantly I'll see manipulation here on the column where you're converting, you're casting, really just so you can get everything that's on July 27th here. So based on our previous example, obviously you're going to see this is non sarkable It's going to take a few seconds to run. In fact, we're even going to see we went parallel here by, you can see the two arrows over here. So how do we make this sarkable? There's two options I tend to see. And this is going to be actual use case where you're not going to get the same results for both of them. So that's another thing you want to watch out for. So my method, which I would prefer, is to do less than equal to the date and then anything less than the date. And the reason why is because a lot of people use between here and they'll think that this gets you the exact same result set, but it's actually going to include results that match this. So while both of these are sargable, and I'll go ahead and run them, we look at the row count here, you're going to see 2,600 over there in that bottom corner. And we look over here, we're going to see that we have more than that. And the main reason over here also is because you're including that last date. So even though I were seeking, keep in mind that this may get you results that, that you're not expecting. So another example is what about, what about those cases where we may want some data based on a year? So same scenario here. I'm going to wrap year around the column and say 2008. We're going to do the same thing over here, except we're just going to say less than or greater than the first day of the year and less than the, next, the first day in the next year. So that way we get all of our records in that year. So same result set about 4,500. The big difference here, which you're going to see constantly throughout this, this example here, these snippets of code, is we're doing our index scan because this is non sarkable which means we're going across the whole index, where here we're able to seek across it. So another good example to, to go over here, go ahead and skip this one at a time because this is pretty similar is those examples where you probably have a parameter and you're looking for a case where I want to pull back records um, from a table where it's not null if it equals my value I'm passing in. If the data is null, then we want to just return it all, which is why you're going to see a couple examples. So the first one, pull less, is basically saying, Give me the first one that's not null. So it's going to go ahead and look here and say, well, is, is this column in this row null? If it's not, it'll return it. If it is, it's going to return this value, which is just simulating a parameter that we're using. So the next one is a function that's using a T-SQL function called isNull. Kind of same thing. The only big difference here, if you wanted to, you could add a lot more parameters into this function here. So right out of the box, you're probably thinking, well, John, you've showed a couple of examples where I'm adding uh, functions around here. I'm adding some code functionality to where I have to do some manipulation to the column before I do my filters. You're probably expecting both of these to do an index scan. The key thing to note here is, is null actually is sargable? So the big thing I wanted to point out with this example to you is there are a couple T-SQL functions that are built in 
that will be sorgable, and ISNOL is one of them. So a nice thing to look at, if we actually look at our plans here, and I'm going to go ahead and zoom in, I want you to see that we have our predicate here for the coalesce. So this is going to go ahead and show us that it's doing is not null, then we're going to search on that filter. So it's kind of rewriting your query in the back end for you, and this is what it's turning it into. If we look over here, we're going to see something different. Because this is a Microsoft T-SQL function, we're going to see that we're able to seek off of this. So a big thing to note, not every single function that you can use is non sargable There are a couple out there that will let you be sargable. The bottom one here is showing you kind of the same thing here. We're just replacing it with isnol or sales order ID. So that way we're going to filter only if that column has a row that is not null that doesn't equal the value that we have here on the right side. So the last example here, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at difference between using Unicode and non-Unicode. So non-varchar versus varchar. So these are two different examples where I have a column that's over here. It's going to be uh, Unicode, so non-varchar. And I'm basically doing a conversion here that's converting from varchar over. And we're going to have the opposite. And the one thing I just wanted to point out from this is that our second one is non sargable while the first one ends up being sargable. So just to let you know that you can go from varchar to nvarchar and still be sargable, but not the other way around. All right, so moving on to a couple of things I want to drive home between table variables, and temp tables. There's a lot of myths out there that I want to go over in this example with you. So just as you've seen before, I'm going to go ahead and turn on my set statistics here. I'm going to go ahead and give me my clean starting point. And then I'm basically going to take a table variable and populate it. So the very first myth that I see out there a lot in the community is that you can't index a table variable. And you actually can if you define a primary key and you tell it to be clustered. So that's one way to where you actually can have an index in a table variable. But from here, all I'm doing is I'm just pumping some data and then I'm filtering off of my table variable that I created. So the most important thing I really want to drive home as the big difference between a table variable and a TAMP table, we're going to see right here. So when you use a table variable, by default, it is always, always going to assume that you have one single row. So even though we're running this and we're looking at the actual execution plan, and in this example we have a thousand rows being pumped in, it's only going to assume one when it's building that execution plan. So because of this, you can get different operators that are included in your plan that can actually end up hindering the performance because it's assuming one row and you could technically have a lot of data that's in there. So there is an exception to this. So that's the next case here. And so even though I hardly ever see this out in the field because there's some pros and cons to any type of code change you're going to want to make, um, this case here we're doing option recompile. So we're basically telling the optimizer when this query runs, rebuild the execution plan for this statement. So while this will require more CPU for you, it will actually go ahead and give you the actual rows when it's building that query plan. So we're going to go ahead and look at it again. And a big difference here is, as I mentioned, because we use option with recompile, we actually have actual good estimates of row. So we don't have any data cardinality issues there from having some bad estimated row counts. 
So the next thing we're going to go ahead and look at is doing the same thing with a temp table. So instead of doing table variable, I'm just creating a temp table in here and we're populating it. We're going to do this, the same thing for our table variable versus our temp table. So a couple of things I'm going to want to drive in on. So as expected before, we have our table variable here. And we're going to see that we're actually doing a merge join. And we have good statistics here, good amount of number of estimated rows versus actual rows. Where over our table variable, we have a completely separate operator. So this is just driving home again here that if you're working with really small data sets that you know are going to be constantly small, table variable could be a good thing for you, but watch out and be careful because as data is growing and you end up having more data in your temp table or table variable, your table variable is not going to give you accurate estimate of row count, which could drive different operators, which could end up hurting performance. All right, so next we're going to go ahead and take a look here at CTEs. So a CTE by itself, especially when kept small, is not a, a bad thing at all. A lot of times I'll see people screaming one way or another, you know, CTEs are good or CTEs are bad. So the first thing I, I want to really just show you is a really small CTE is not really different at all from the inline select statement. So this very first CTE here, we're just going to head and sum up the, the totals over here for each salesperson. And then the key driver I see a lot, not always, but a lot, is a lot of people are using CTEs to get an end result query that looks really nice. So here's an example where we're doing select star from our CTE. And this is just including it here as a line SQL statement. These two are exactly the same thing. So when this runs, you're going to see the same results. When we're looking over here, you're going to see exactly the same I.O. behind this. So we'll go ahead and add our actual execution plan in here. So this is where I tend to see CTE start to go bad. Uh, it's when you are nesting them. So a lot of times I'll see that people use a CTE because they're really after something that looks real good as an end result of the query, but they're nesting CTEs to do a lot of work. Uh, I mean, a perfect example, too, of where this may come into play is just the architectural decision where you're, you're real heavy on using a lot of views. So I, I once worked in a scenario where a custom reporting framework was rolled out, but it was all dependent upon always using select from view and then adding filters to it. So when you start to do more work, you're limited on what you can do and tend to see a lot of nested CTEs like this. So here's just a, a, a pretty simple example where you're going to see that we're looking for net sales, order quantity, sales quota, and we're doing this by using multiple CTEs. So when I say multiple CTEs, you see our first one here, but then you can see after that we're doing another CTE here. And this CTE is really there just to help us with our sales quota. And then after that, we have another CTE in here to help us get our, our average in here. And after that, we end up having our, our select statement in here. So we'll go ahead and run this. We're going to see here, this is going to go ahead and take a few seconds. And then while that's running here, I have both examples here, but for time, we'll go ahead and we'll focus on, you can see here it took about 26 seconds for this to run. We'll come back to this, but I'm going to show you with temp table, 
The big difference here is we're able to split these up. So the optimizer is able to optimize each subset of that part of the, the CTE that was in there. So the real big difference here is we're creating our temp tables. We're going to populate each one with each little subset in there. And then instead of just having to select the columns from the last CTE, we're going to end up joining them across here towards those temp tables we created. So we can see we had a, a real ugly execution plan in here. When I say ugly, it means there's a whole lot of operators that are going on in here. The key thing to, to drive home here is that this took 26 seconds for it to run. So if we go ahead and we take this, and first we're going to go ahead and we're going to clear out so we have that same starting point. So we're going to see much quicker, obviously there's still rooms for improvement in here. But there's a couple of nice things about this approach of breaking this nested CTE down into temp tables is the fact that one, you can see it clearly ran much faster. But two, you also have separate execution plans for each portion of it. So that way you can go ahead and optimize the part that needs the most work. So for example, here we can see that our cost was 100% of 100% here. So this is where you want to focus on your optimization efforts. All right. And then, so another one I want to look at here, which I, I apologize, I, I skipped over this. So I want to definitely make sure that we go over this is looking at user defined functions. So a lot of times I see user defined functions being executed mainly because similar to object oriented programming, here's an object I can create in a database. I can reuse it so I don't have to rewrite queries at all. And I could just constantly just plug in this function and let it so here's a real simple user-defined scalar function that's going to go in here and it's going to get us our max order quantity for each product. So as you pass in a product ID here, it'll end up getting you that max order for it. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. It's already in there. All right. So this is what I'll typically see. And let me go back over to our extended event in here. And I'm going to go ahead and tell this to start. And we have our offenders running. And the main reason why is I'm going to show you a case here where what we're actually going to see can be a little misleading from our set statistics and even the execution plan in here. So when I go ahead and I run this, so all I'm doing here is it's similar to object-oriented programming. I got my user-defined function that can easily be reused. All I'm going to do here is for every row inside a product, it's going to pass in a product ID and use that user-defined function. There's going to be a couple of interesting things that I want to point out here. The very first one is, as, I, as you can see, we're watching our extended event that we have that's capturing our offenders, every single row is calling that function. So we have some row by row processing that's going on. And the key thing to know is when we actually look at our information where this query stops running, we're not going to see any of that information inside of our statistics or even our execution plan. So here's a case where what you see could be a little misleading. For example, if I really just focus on my set statistics I.O. here, I'm going to see what looks good. I've got my four logical reads here. The thing that's going to really start frustrating me if I'm only looking at the set statistic time here is, you know, why is this query that's only 
doing four logical reads taking 30 seconds to run. And if you notice, if you look here, one of the key things you're going to see here is we're just going across product table. And that's because we don't have any of that information behind that inline function, that, that user-defined function that's being called over and over again. So we look at our execution plan, same thing here. We have our index, and the only thing you see us doing is looking at the product table. So we're not even hitting our other table, which is inside of the function. So how do we go about making this better? One way you can do this is by using a user-defined table function. So instead of processing row by row, this is actually going to take a result set approach to this to where it's going to take your set data and it's going to take those product IDs and filter off of that to get you the max order quantity. So in here, this is already going to be there, which it is. Just wanted to double check there. And the big difference here is instead of doing our select where we're putting that in there, we're doing a cross apply. So it's using set based logic instead of row by row where it's going to take the product ID from the set and place it in here and do the cross apply, which is then going to get you your max quantity. So I'll go ahead and clear this out. And we're going to go ahead and run this. And we're going to see instead of 20 seconds, this is going to be quite a bit quicker. In fact, here it took about five seconds in this example. The nice thing here, first of all, is you see everything. So we can see exactly how much sales order detailed on large table here, how many logical reads were occurring there. Where before, with the user-defined scalar function, we didn't even see anything with that table. Also on our execution plan here, we're going to see that we have both tables, the product in here, and we have our sales order detail table right there. So we're seeing our full execution plan and how long it took. So while there's still maybe some optimizations that could be made, especially on the indexing side, this is showing you a big difference between using a scalar user-defined function versus inline. And the last thing to focus on here is a lot of times, too, when I see real small, trivial, user-defined table functions, they can even be completely replaced with just a select statement by itself, which is shown below. So here, the execution plan is the same. The data that you're going to get here is the same. And we're going to see that we have the same thing over there. So with that, I think we've got about five minutes left. So I think this is probably a great stopping point for us today. Um, so Rob, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you and see if we have any questions, that, a few questions that we can answer with the time we have left here. Sure. Um, so one of the questions was about when you uh, show the table information, uh, they, had, they were basically asking uh, what the keystroke you used, and as I recall, you just hit Alt F1, and it brought up all the, it was a quick way to see the table information, right? That is correct. Yeah, so Alt F1 will give you a quick view. It, it won't show you everything. There's a lot of other um, scripts that people have developed that can get you more information, like detailed about the filtered indexes if you have any, and some some other stuff there. But yeah, Alt F1 will be a quick, easy way for you to look at the, the object definition and what's included in it. Um, so here's another question you uh, went over earlier in the presentation. I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, they want to know why you did the checkpoint. Gotcha. So the checkpoint was done. So whenever you're, you're changing data, it doesn't necessarily get written immediately to the actual data file. So a checkpoint is used to take data pages that haven't been sent down to the data file yet. So that way they're put in there. Okay. Um, this is just a, uh, another question, just a general question. Uh, they want to know, will this session be uh, recorded? And, and yes, it's recorded. And we're going to put it on um, the past data architecture chapter. Also on my blog, I'll put a link to it so we can all uh, view it, you know, after, 
you know, later on or as much as we want to. Um, let's go on. Let's see. Um, a lot of questions coming in. Wow. Um, let's see. On the temp table variable, let me refer, on the temp variable table, what are the drawbacks of doing recompile if you have a large table? The drawback if you do with option recompile is the fact that you have to recompile the plan. So every time that would run, it's not going to take plans that currently exist in memory that can help you. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's see. Here's another one. Oh, wow. A lot of... All right. How can I avoid spill in temp DB? That's a great question, and that's... Uh, uh, a little more advanced and take more time to go over. So I'll make sure that you email me or contact me. I put up the slide with my contact information so I can go over some more of that. If you go ahead and contact me at jstarrett at gmail. Okay. Um, are we covering exist versus counts? I don't believe you covered that. No, I, I, I cut that out due to, okay. due to timing. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what, what I'll do is I'll go over that and I'll throw it up on my blog. So if you see there, all of the code that we've gone through in the sample database that I have where I build out that extended table, you can get from the link that's provided up above. Um, so what I'll do is I will we'll do that last example and I'll record a short video and I'll throw that up there on my blog. Do you have a few minutes? Do you want to do it? Uh, I mean, I have a. We can go a few minutes over if you'd like, or do you want to push that off till later? Um, no, we we can. Do we want to do that, and then we'll just, I guess, go through all the the other questions. You can email them over to me, and I'll. Yeah, I can. We can forward the questions off to you um, after the presentation. If you okay. if you have a few minutes, uh, I do. So we can just go a little over. If yeah, that's right. that one will. That's actually a good quick one here. So let me. Go back over. So one thing that I, I constantly see out in the field is a query similar to this, to where you basically want to do something. In this case, we're just printing, but we're doing a quick check just to see if we have data that's being returned by our query. So in this case here, we'll go ahead and we'll turn on our set statistics IO on. And all I'm doing here is just saying where a query order equals one, I want to count and figure out okay, how many of those exist. And then my end goal, the real reason for doing this, is to do some other work where I have sales. So the problem with this approach is it's actually going to have to fully run this first query. Helps if I go ahead and flip over here to my AdventureWorks database. So this is going to take quite a bit to run. And the main reason why is it's going across all of these pages. So it's actually going across and running that full query. If you end up doing if exists, the nice thing is this is a terminator. So as soon as it actually runs into a case where a record exists, it's going to go ahead and stop, and then you can do that work you wanted it to do. So if we look at exists in here, we're going to see that after three reads, it found a record and it was able to terminate and not run the rest of that query. So the big difference there between the exists there is that it's a terminating, uh, terminating uh, function there that will actually go ahead and terminate once it reaches, reaches what you're evaluating instead of running that whole entire query, which this is what we're doing up here. Well, thank you. Thank you for going into that, John. Ah, no problem. Okay, so at this point, we're going to kind of, um, if it's okay with you, uh, uh, we'll just stop, and uh, I'll bundle the questions up and forward them over to John, and I want to thank everyone for uh, joining today. We had a great audience. Over 200 people showed up, and uh, thank you all for uh, participating and being part of the Data Architecture chapter, and thank you, John, for coming. It's really a pleasure having you here. Yeah, no, thank you for, for having me. Uh, I was happy to do this with you. Okay. All right, well, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Uh, we're going to stop the recording and stop the audio, and uh, hope to see you all later at the next presentation. Thank you. Bye.